That may be a hard act to follow. <laughs> well, I'm excited to introduce our guest speakers today. Uh, I, I'm reading it because it's important that you know about these delightful people. So Amy Blankson is the co-founder and chief evangelist of the Digital Wellness Institute. She graduated from Harvard and Yale School of Management. You might think she's a little smart, okay? She's the best-selling author of the book, The Future of Happiness, a member of the UN Global Happiness Council, and is the only person to receive a Point of Light award from two US presidents. So impressive, yeah. And then, <clears throat> her handsome husband, Dr. Blankston, is referred lovingly and affectionately to as Dr. Bobo. Seriously, so you will meet Dr. Bobo later. Um, he's also a graduate of Harvard and Yale School of Medicine. Do you guys just sit around and have a think tank going on a lot? Wow, How, it's I'm so impressive. As an adolescent medicine specialist with a private practice at Girls to Women and Young Men's Health and Wealth, Wellness Center, he is widely published, recently certified as a culinary medicine specialist, served as a featured professor in Oprah's Happiness course. Please welcome these two lovely, we're honored to have you people. Good morning. What a wonderful intro. Whew. And hard to follow that act by the band. They were amazing. We are not going to sing for you today. We are not going to sing. But we are going to tell you some stories. And I do want to start with a lovely story about traveling. I don't know. Anybody in here like to travel? Like, do you guys like to travel? Yeah. Yeah, travel's amazing. And, you know, the time in the pandemic was a really difficult time because we didn't get to travel very much or as much as we wanted to. And as things kind of came to an end, we looked forward to taking a amazing parent-only vacation slash retreat. And we're very grateful that our daughters are here. They're here in the second row. And um, it was very nice that our very responsible 17-year-old, there she is, Anna, <laughs> was willing to watch her sisters for a weekend so that we could get away for a retreat. And, you know, we were super excited about this trip and it was just gonna be the Saturday, Sunday. We were eager to get back to the kids. We had a wonderful time, but there were a few snafus. There were just a couple of issues. One, this lady who is, you know, two-time Point of Light Award winner, travels all the time, speaks all over the world, travels all far and wide. She did not have a valid photo ID on her. I don't know how that happened. That's another story. But Amy did not have a valid photo ID. In Dallas, that wasn't a problem. They let us on the plane. I think she had her expired like military ID because I was in the military. And that, that part went fine. When we were leaving on Sunday though, the San Diego TSA was not as delicate. They were, they were, they were really kind of, hey, um, I don't know if you can get on this plane. And I'm like, uh, Amy, we've got to get on this plane. We've got to get back to the kids. Tomorrow they have school. We want to tuck them in. We've been gone all weekend. I was like, I can't leave you, Amy. I can't leave you. She's like, no, you can leave me. Like, please go get, get home. One of us has to get home and I'll try to work through this. So I go through, I get through TSA. I'm at the gate and I'm waiting. I'm texting her. Oh, Amy, come on. Like they've already called our group, group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven. She's not there. Finally, she arrives before the doors close. We rush onto the plane. We think the ordeal is over, and I'm about to share with you guys a very first world problem. We got to our seats. We're very efficient travelers, like I said. We just had our two carry-ons because we're going to land in Dallas and get home and tuck the kids in. Well, when you get on the plane last, first of all, everybody looks at you like you're the worst person because you held them up. But secondly, there's no room in the overhead bins. So there we were at, you know, row 16 and sat there and looked up at the overhead bins and we're like, oh, there's no space. And the stewardess is just like, I guess you're gonna have to go put it in the back. So 10 rows back I walk, you know, passing everybody, bumping them with my two suitcases, put our suitcases up, and we walk back to row 16. And I'm thinking to myself, we're never gonna get off this plane, Amy. We're gonna get home at 10.30, the kids will be asleep. Where is the joy? Where is the joy? 
And that's the central question that we're gonna talk about here today is where are the joy in these little moments? We'll get back to the story here shortly, but when we think about joy, typically we think about this kind of explosive moment of happiness, this levity, you're jumping in the air and you're in the middle of a mountaintop experience and you feel this great sense of joy. Except that real joy doesn't always look like that. A lot of times that might be a burst of happiness, but joy, joy feels a little bit different, right? It feels like a, a deeper, more lasting kind of moment. And sometimes it can be very difficult to find. Bobo and I spend a lot of time thinking about this topic. We've been working on a book that we're calling The Joy Game. And so we spent a lot of time as the first question, figuring out what is joy? How do you define joy? I've spent about 18 years now studying the science of happiness. The definition of the science of happiness according to the ancient Greeks is the joy you feel striving after your potential. But joy is just a little qualitatively different. And so as we looked at different definitions from everywhere from theologians to philosophers to the American Psychological Association, here were a couple of our favorite definitions. Joy is a feeling of inner gladness, delight, or rejoicing. Joy is a sense of deep, lasting satisfaction. Again, that feeling that it continues on for a long period of time. Joy is a culmination of anticipation. So it's not just the moment, it's everything leading up to the moment and the moment. And the last one, joy is an experience of happiness and flow. So it's little bits of happiness over time creates a longer feeling of joy. And as we think about this, there's even a definition difference between passive joy and active joy. So passive joy is what we kind of experience internally. It's that feeling of contentment that we experience. Whereas active joy is that moment where you begin to share joy with other people. It's interpersonal um, versus intrapersonal. And so I think, you know, we, we talk about this a lot. And why don't you share some of your feelings on, on joy as well? Yeah. Like when we came to this, this word joy, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm a scientist, so I approach everything kind of first with my brain. And I'm like, okay, so we're not the first people to think about joy. I'm sure it's been researched. So I go to my research sources. And as a doctor, first I started in the medical literature. I wanted to look through the NIH websites. I wanted to go through PubMed. I even went to Google Scholar. I was like, let me look to see what psychologists, doctors, theologians, what do they say about joy? And it won't surprise you, there's not a ton of research out there on joy because it can be kind of hard to, to really quantify. But what, what I found was these, these key statements that everybody seemed to agree on. Joy is fundamental to human existence. No serious discussion of human flourishing is possible without a consideration of the nature of joy and its place in the good life, right? Even in the Bible, right, we have these, these verses like Proverbs 17, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit it dries up bones, right? There are multiple references to joy, 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 joy. So what is this thing? Like, what is this joy? Even this morning, before I came to this, I, I said, Mom, I'm going to church today. I'm going to give a talk. And she's like, oh, well, let me tell you about my weekend and how some things happened that just stole my joy. And I was like, wow, joy must be important, right, guys? If it's something that people can steal, right, it must be precious to us, right? Some, <laughs> If somebody can steal it, it must be precious. So joy is important to us. And in my practice, right, I take care of teens and young adults. And these young people come with me for all sorts of reasons, a lot of it being mental health, right? I work with a lot of kids who are depressed, anxious, have other issues. It's hard for me to find that teenager who comes in and really understands what joy is. And, you know, I think I'm talking to a group of people who see young people constantly on their phones, right? just obsessed with social media, obsessed with their, with, their, with their image, playing video games. And I think a lot of these things that young people participate in bring them happiness, but I don't think that it brings them this lasting joy that we're going to speak about with you today. And there's a difference really between that hedonism, it's that moment of like, pleasure versus eudaimonia, that deeper joy. As the, the Greeks were so wise about that, as were the theologians. But as we're thinking about why joy is so important, it is because it's that connection to a life well lived that we yearn for so deeply. And sometimes you don't even know how important joy is to you until you don't have it. And then you pine for it and you yearn for it. And when you find it, it's that much more sweet. 
Um, but in your clinic, I know you don't even talk about joy that often, right? Like that's something that, that I think we could do a better job as society of really leaning into what joy might look like. Um, and yet, I think we sometimes still struggle to understand how do we know if we're feeling joyful? Yeah, so, so once again, in my very scientific brain, I said to myself, well, if joy is something that we should talk about, maybe it can be measured. And I know that my lovely wife and her research on happiness, you know, she's been part of developing happiness scales. And then in her work with digital wellness, she developed a digital wellness survey. And I said, well, there must be something on that for joy, right? So in the research, there was a group of psychologists who actually did come up with something called a, a state joy scale. And they came up with two scales. There was one that was a state joy scale, which is, you know, can you experience joy in this very specific amount of time? Have you experienced joy? And then there's a dispositional joy scale, which is more like, are you just a joyful person? Is this baked into your DNA? And I know out there, like, we're thinking, well, there are certainly people who are just joyful, right? Just that baseline. I mean, I think all of us kind of think, oh, yeah, there's that person who always just seems to be happy about everything. Like, nothing really bothers them. And some of us aren't wired that way. But the state joy scale is really interesting. And I thought it would be a good exercise for those of you who would like to participate. I'm going to run you through the state joy scale, okay? And what I'd like you to think of as I go through this 11-point scale, I want you to answer these questions in your head kind of on a scale of one to five. So a five would be that you strongly agree with the statement I'm gonna read, a three is kind of neutral, and a one is you strongly disagree, okay? So there's gonna be 11 parts of the state joy scale. I'm gonna read through each one, okay? Score it from your seats if you want. So ready, number one. In the past week, how often have you felt joyful? So five being the most and like one being the least. Like you strongly disagree and one you strongly disagree. You strongly disagree. Okay, the second question. In the past week, how often have you felt enthusiastic? Question three. Because of the joy I experienced this week, time just seemed to fly. Question four. This week I found myself enjoying something so much that I lost track of time. Question five. This week I felt free. Question six, I, this week I felt ready to enjoy whatever opportunity presented itself. Question seven, something happened this week that made me feel like celebrating. Question eight, this week the reality of my life was the way I felt it should be. Question nine, and this is my favorite one actually, this week I felt free to play. Question 10, my life went well. And question 11, this week, life just made sense to me. Okay, so hopefully out there you were scoring these one, one threes and fives. And look, if you scored a lot of fours and fives, you're like, okay, yeah, I'm a pretty joyful person. I had a pretty joyful week. And if you didn't, if you scored a lot of threes or twos or ones, you know, maybe it's not that you're a joyful person. Maybe you didn't have a great week. But the question I want you to be asking is, how can I have more moments of joy? And I go back to that question nine, you know, how can I feel free to play? Awesome, and so when we're thinking about this, a lot of times joy in week to week can shift and change based on what's going on maybe in the external environment, maybe what's going on inside of you, things you've been thinking about, but sometimes joy can feel so elusive. It can feel very hard to obtain or even qualitatively get to that experience. And I wanted to ask that question because I think it's pretty central to our experience of joy. And sometimes, I want to posit that sometimes I think we actually hold ourselves back from experiencing more joy. Maybe you say, you know, I've been there, I've done that, I tried that, it didn't work. Or you say, you know, I, I tried to be joyful, but there's so many things coming at me. We've just had the fourth flood at our house in like the last 18 months. And let me tell you, when that happens, Hard it challenges joy. my joy. <laughs> but I will say that in these moments, the thing that I have to remind myself is that joy is something that is in our control. We as humans have this agency to choose joy, that it can be a mindset even if you're not genetically predisposed to it. And so what we want to do is help you think through today, you know, what if we were able to think about joy a little bit more like a game? Sometimes we, we make pursuit of joy so difficult, but what if we actually enjoyed the process of seeking after joy? 
And so that's what we want to do. We want to help you to think about, you know, what if you were to walk away from here today thinking, you know, you knew what things brought you joy and you knew that you had certain habits that helped you to get to a place of greater joy on a daily basis and that you knew when you were starting to feel less joyful that you knew what you needed to do to help yourself get back to a place of feeling more joy in your life. And this is what the joy game is all about. It's what we hope to lead you into today, and we're gonna give you three very quick, very simple strategies that you can walk out of here and say, this week, I'm gonna practice being more joyful. And the first one comes back to this idea of being open. Now, for me and the pandemic, I remember that there was a lot of shifting of things for all of us. One of the things that really shifted and sort of broke for me was some of my friendships. I looked around and I felt like I just didn't have the kind of satisfaction I wanted in some of my friendships for a variety of reasons. And I remember the day that I said to myself, you know what? I'm gonna seek after some new friends. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for friends and I'm gonna be open to finding them anywhere. They could be the coffee barista, they could be the Uber driver, they could be the person that I walk and meet on the street, they could be a person that I meet at a talk. And what happened over the next year, uh, really the last year, has been that I, I actually found those people. One of the people who hired me for a talk became one of my closest friends. One of the people who was down the street became somebody that was cutting my hair and discovered we lived in the same neighborhood and we suddenly hit up a friendship. And so these conversations kind of came out of what felt like nowhere, but if I could track it back, it would come from initially being open. Yeah. So when Amy made the slide, I thought that she chose this image very, I was like, Amy, that looks a lot like Jesus. Was that intentional? And I don't, I don't know. She's very clever. But, <laughs> you know, like thinking about this, this talk, I said, you know, who was more open than Jesus? I feel like in like my appreciation of the life of Jesus, you know, he was so open to everything and to everyone, right? Like Jesus was not afraid to hang out with children. Jesus would hang out with prostitutes. Jesus would hang out with tax collectors, with tax collectors, with religious people, with his disciples. It didn't matter. He was open to everything and everyone. And what a gift that was to mankind. What a gift that was to others. How could we be more open like that, where we're open to experiences, we're open to people, but this openness, I think, is what gives us the opportunity to really embrace and receive joy. And sometimes we get trapped in our own habits even. We go through our day, and there's certain things that, I, I call it like a mental commute we take every day. Like my mental commute is from my bed, beeline to the coffee machine, right? <laughs> sometimes twice. And as we go through these routines, we fall into the habits that become easy for our brain to follow. But I think sometimes those habits are the very things that hold us back as well. And so as we're talking about playing the joy game, one of the things we wanted to do was to shift up habits. And one of my dear sweet husband's habits, let's go back to the airplane. So one of his habits is that when we're on an airplane, he likes to get off the airplane fast. He likes to be the first off the plane with the bags, let's get on our way. And this particular day that we opened with where we are the last people on the plane and our bags are stuck at the back was very frustrating for you. Very frustrating, very stressed. I wanted to get home to the kids. I knew they were waiting for us. So. Here we are, we finally land, right? And now it's like, okay, Amy, I've gotta get back there. I've gotta get the luggage. And I stand up from my seat, you know, like everybody does, as soon as the plane lands, before they even say, take off your seatbelt, everybody's jumping up and, you know, ready to go. I stand up and I make eye contact with the stewardess and she's like, well, I guess you're gonna have to frog your way back there to get to your suitcases. And literally, we spend the entire flight at this point, one, stressing about how we're gonna get to our bags, and two, talking about the joy game and how we can make life more of a game. And here, the stewardess is like, you have to frogger your way back. How many of you have ever played the game Frogger? Has anyone played the, the okay, game of Frogger right, here? Right. Okay. So just briefly, for those of you who haven't, you know, this is a very old arcade game. I think I played it on my Atari growing up. You're a frog, sorry kids. The Atari's a very, very old video game system. <laughs> very old, okay? So there's a little frog and you've got to get across the busy street and there's cars and semi trucks and then there's a river and there's logs and alligators and you're moving your little frog up to the top of the screen trying to avoid death, right? That's Frogger. This is what the stewardess said I needed to do to get to our bags. 
So here Bobo is, he's looking at his bags, he's made eye contact with the stewardess. She says, you have to frog your way back. So that's what he starts doing. He like pulls into one aisle and then he goes over to the other side of the aisle. And then what he can't see that I see from the front of the plane is that when the stewardess suggested the game of Frogger, the people's eyes around us started to light up. And not only was Bobo playing the game of Frogger, but it turns out that several other people were helping him play the game of Frogger. Yeah. It was pretty wild. Nobody was trying to kill me, but, <laughs> but they were getting out of my way and letting me get to my bags, which brings us to, to point number two, which is you have to play the game, guys. And I hope you guys love games. I know that I love games, right? Um, I love you know, video games, I love board games. Uh, I know out there there's probably people who play you know, Mahjong and Bridge and there's- Rummy all... Cube, I heard there's Rummy a Rummy Cube. Cube game. There's Bingo, right? There's so many games that we play. Why did we choose games as our vehicle for helping people find joy? Well, I think it's pretty simple. When you talk about a game, you're almost instantly talking about something that's going to bring you fun and joy. You usually play games with people that you love, with your friends, with your family, right? There's usually an outcome, right? When you win, you get something, and that's something that's also built into joy. But the joy in a game isn't only in the winning, right? It's also in the experience with the people that you're with. I know how I get excited just about you know, setting up a game, and there's a game that we've played for years called The Settlers of Catan. Has anybody played that game? Okay, Settlers of Catan. Like those of you out there know that it can be kind of a little bit of a cutthroat game, but you, you trade and you build and you're building little settlements. And I played with this lady for like 23 years. And even to this day, she still has the number one rule of settlers, Amy, is go ahead, tell everybody. Never trade with Bobo. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it just rolls off of her tongue because that's how we played this game for 23 years. But we still enjoy playing with each other. And there's so much joy, guys, that we get out of games. And it may be sports that you play. Maybe you like tennis now or pickleball. That's a new craze, right? Maybe it's a, you know, something else like fishing, right? Yeah, we talked about that this morning. My dad loves fishing. And he goes like once a year. He just never makes time to go fishing except when his friend invites him on the annual fishing trip. And so Bobo suggested, you know, he spends all his time in the garage working on sorting out old things that he wanted to pass on to the children or, you know, getting going through old memories. He said, what if he went into the garage and made it a game of fishing? He's looking for the big fish. What, what fish is he gonna catch that day? Could he make it more fun by just simply, simply taking something he loves and transforming a, a very tedious task that he's been going through. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, playing games, guys, this is, this is one of the primary ways I think that we can tap into joy, which brings us to the last thing, which is we've got to savor, we've got to savor these moments, right? And we've told this story about the suitcase, and of course the end of the story is I got to the suitcases, I got quickly back to our seats and we got off the plane and we got to tuck the kids in bed. So happy ending, right? But, but, but we have told this story so many times and every time I tell it, what? Every time we tell it, Amy. Every time we tell it, it makes us happy. Uh, it makes us feel joyful because I think from the moment we got off the plane and the stewardess connected with us on this idea, which did feel a bit like a spiritual moment that she even thought about it at the same time, to the moment we got home, we told the kids, and we began to relive this moment. Turns out our brains can't always tell the difference between visualization and actual experience, and so every time we relive the story, it brings us joy again, and we share it, and it brings others joy, and that's what savoring's all about. So I wanted to share with you today five of the fastest, simplest strategies for savoring in your lives that maybe you want to lean into some of them to help you to really um, savor your joy. And so these five habits, we call them the J game. And they stand for journaling, gratitude, acts of kindness, meditation, and even exercise as a strategy. And what happens is that when you do these habits, what happens is that your brain begins to have not only a physical reaction, like you're, you're journaling so you get that physical paper, but you're also making connections in your brain. You're forming new neural pathways that help you to see more joy, to feel the joy, to share the joy. And maybe you can talk a little bit about exercise and why that one made the list. Well, I mean, I think it's pretty clear to me as a doctor, but we know that there's scientific data that shows that when we exercise, our brain actually experiences a boost in mood, right? Endorphins are released, other chemicals are released that actually boost our happiness. So we know that exercise is so important, but I think that exercise just also makes us feel alive, and part of being alive is being joyful. So I feel like there's, there's so much more that we wanna say about this, but we really wanted just to leave you guys with these three points. Um, 
I was thinking through like the Apostle Paul, Amy, and how he went through these fruits of the Spirit. And I was like, ha, huh, fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Wait, jo jo joy was the second one. Joy was the second one that he listed because I think it's that important, right after love. Why isn't joy something that we seek after more in our lives? So we hope that you guys have enjoyed this. Yeah, absolutely. And we wanted to leave you and close out with a meditation to give you a moment to just think about your own joy. So if you get to a place where you feel comfortable, um, wiggle around and maybe close your eyes and take a deep breath. And I'm going to guide you through a little meditation to experience more of this joy. Um, flicker your eyes open, actually, for one more moment. And I want you to look at the screen here, at the sparkler on the screen. And I want you to sear that image in your head here for this meditation. Okay, so you've got the picture of the sparkler, and close your eyes. And what I want you to do is to think about that kind of in your mind's eye, starting with your head. And I want you to think about joy really beginning to take root in your mind, experiencing it, feeling it, feeling the excitement, the sizzle of having the, the, the joy take off in your mind. And I want you to let that joy slowly radiate down your body, traveling down through your head, your shoulders, your neck, out through your arms, your fingers, and your toes. I want your, you to feel that joy emanating, radiating from within you, out beyond to touch other people. And as you're doing this, take a deep breath in. And I want you to feel the openness. And breathe out. And one more deep breath in. And as you're breathing in, I want you to think about ways in your life that maybe you could be a little bit more open carving out space to make room for joy to come flooding in. I want you to take time as you continue to breathe and take another breath and think about joy, joyous games, things that bring you so much joy in your life, whether it's friends, family, fitness, faith, um, fun, all those things that bring you that joy. Maybe you haven't done as much of recently. What if you made time and space starting today, starting right after service, to do something that really brought you that sense of joy. And then I want you to savor that feeling inside of you so that later this week, when there are things that are challenging, you can come back to this place of feeling that sparkler, just that little bit of light begin to radiate out and find a newness inside of you. One more deep breath in. And as you breathe out, I want you to exhale joy to those around you and feel the expansiveness. And with that, my friends, let's open our eyes and thank you so much for letting us be part of your day to day. We hope you feel more joy and space in your life. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>